We're, uh, we're in a series about values. Uh, values meaning the things that control our lives. Uh, values that we obtain through our lives are what actually dictate the destiny and even our future in life. Uh, so today I want to talk about a part of it about changing values. We've talked about back in the box. We've talked about values from the kingdom. But today, my emphasis is I want to talk about how do we change our values? How do you get there from here? How do we, how do we change the values? So I want to begin today by asking you a question uh, that we all need to, to deliberate about. We all need to think about. When was the last time that you changed something about your life that was very difficult to change? And I'm not talking about changing our hair color, although that can be difficult sometimes. I'm not talking about getting a new pair of shoes or even buying a new house. I'm talking about changing your life. I'm, t I'm talking about, about changing your character. How do you do that? When was the last time you did that? When was the last time you changed something about yourself? Now, let me define character. Character is the inherent complexity of attributes that determine a person's moral and ethical actions and reactions. Let me read it one more time. Character is the inherent complexity of attributes that determine a person's moral and ethical actions and reactions. Do we get that? I, I want to I I make sure that we see the, the, the thought here behind this, you know, it's a, it says that these are inherent attributes. These are, these are things that are inborn into us, that are inherited. We inherit these things. These things are indigenous to us. These, these things are instinctive. It's how we instinctively respond to life. We respond to life by our character. We make decisions in life about character. And this can be anything from from the desire to be a homosexual to the desire to be the president of the United States. It can be anything concerning how I raise my children or how I love my wife or how I pay my bills. This is, this is your character. All of these responses and instincts to ha instinctiveness as to how we approach life all come from our character. So when was the last time you did something about yours? It says that uh, it's moral and ethical reactions that we have. It's how we respond morally. It's how we respond ethically. How we treat people comes from our character. Do we love people? Do we hate people? Are we mean to people? How do we respond ethically to people? Are we, do we cheat people? Are we honest? How do you do on your taxes? <laughs> Maybe we need to change a few things, huh? And if I want to change anything about me, then I must change a part of my character, and that part of my character is called values. I've got to change my values if I want to change my character. So, back to the question, when was the last time you did something to change your character? Now, I ask you another question. Is it possible for me to change my character? Can I do that? Is it biblically possible? Is it biblically po possible for me to change my character? Um, if you're writing notes, write this down. A person's character is formed by the time they leave their teen teenage years. Um, when you enter your marriage, your character is formed. When you're raising your children, your character is formed. As you go through life, you're going through life according to your character. Um, do you know that uh, some people go all the way through life and never change theirs? The things that they inherited instinctively from their parents, from society, from their home, from their peers, determines and dictates the way they run the rest of their lives. They never change for the better. And they just let life take them where life wants them to go, where their character has already de destined them to head. You see, our character defines our destiny. 
Can I change it? Is it possible to change my character? Why would I even want to? Aren't I just fine like I am? Huh? Why would I want to change my character? And here's the answer. Because by changing my character, I change my future. You see, a lot of us approach life from the way that we're just going to go in life and we're going to be successful. You're not going to be successful if you have a bad character. If your values are impure, you're not going to be successful. You're going to be a failure. And if your values are to be a homosexual, guess what you're going to be? Come on. And if your values are to have a, a great marriage, then you're going to have one. But if you don't have values there, you're not going to have one. See, values are determined as we approach life, but can you change them? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And that's what today's lesson is about. How do we change ours? How can I help my children change theirs? How can I help anyone? How can I help you change yours? Isn't that great? Uh, how many of you remember the, uh, the movie, The Christmas Carol? Uh, that's the classic by Charles Dickinson. Remember it? It's Scrooge. Remember Scrooge? Maybe you remember it better by Scrooge. If you've, if you've seen the old classic, the old black and white one, raise your hand. Let somebody sing. That was great, 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 great. Well, what I've done today, you know, you remember Ebenezer Scrooge. Now, how do you remember him? What do you, what's the first thought that comes to you about oh, Ebenezer? Bah humbug. Bah humbug. Did, but see, you don't remember that he got born again. You don't remember that he entered the kingdom. Isn't that amazing how we think about people? See, that whole movie was about a transformation of this man and his values and his character changing. Isn't it amazing? We think, the first thing we think about people is the negative aspects of their character. See, the movie wasn't about him staying that way. The movie was about him being changed. See, your life isn't about you staying the way you are. Your life is about us changing and becoming into the very image of Jesus Christ, changing from glory. I just got excited. I am not the same as I was in 1978. Hallelujah. My wife is praising God there. And I won't be the same next year as I am this year. Why? Because I am in a cocoon. I am being transformed. The movie is about changing. It's about his transformation. Ebenezer need, needed to change. Remember, you remember about him, right? You remember how, how he was the bah humbug guy? And, and, and the reason that he was so messed up is because his values were all scrooged up. <laughs> so what I've done is I've got that movie, and I watched it, and I got some clips. And there's about five or six little clips in there. Take about seven or eight minutes. We're going to watch it. But I want, to watch you, I want you to see some things. Here's what I want you to look for in these clips that I've selected here. I want you to notice that when, when his values were formed. When were his values formed? Notice what formed his values. Notice how those values controlled his life and how it controlled how he acted and treated people. Notice, uh, notice that it was... Something spiritual that changed him. Notice what he had to realize and recognize and experience before he could change. Is all that in that movie? Oh, yeah. That and more. I mean, I, sure guess, I, yeah, I could have just showed the whole movie this morning. It would have been the message. But, but, but this, this in there. So we're going to take seven or eight minutes. We're going to watch it. Notice those things. You never look at that movie again the same way, will you? I won't. I know that. I, uh, I, it, it really brought out some, some thoughts to me. Um, what were Scrooge's values formed by before his transformation? What? Greed money. But they were formed before he was out of his teens. Um, 
at school when his dad wouldn't let him come home for Christmas. This Christmas wasn't important. Being with family wasn't important. All that was important was getting an education and making money. Formed his values. His society, his home, his peers formed his values. We saw that. He was controlled by greed and anger. He treated people like idiots. He looked down on them like they were beneath him. That they weren't as smart as him because they enjoyed life differently. He, he was in values of chains. He had forged chains through his life that were actually a bondage on him and that would determine the rest of his life. Our values determine our future. Your character determines your end. He was changed by a spiritual visitation. Now, I know, you got to see what Dickinson was after him. I know there were ghosts. But in the King James Version, the Holy Spirit is called the Holy Ghost. And these now came and lived within him. And who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first, the last, and the present? You see, and he's going to live that way from now on. Uh, and he did change. Scrooge did change. Ebenezer Scrooge needed to see his past, his present, and his future before he could really make a change in his life. And you know what? You do too. Until you see where, you, where your values have gotten you, what they've brought you through, and most of the time it's negative, and where you're at today in your values, and see where your values are going to take you tomorrow, you're not going to change. But if you see the way you're doing things, the way you, we pay bills, the way we treat our family, the way we treat people, the way we work, if you're happy with that, then you're not going to change it. But if you're not happy with that, it's not going to get better unless you change something. And what's got to change are values. So what I want to do is I want to give you five ways that values change. Now, I, you know, I told you that this was biblical. And I told you that were people in the Bible ever changed? <laughs> sure they were. Sure they were. Sure they were. Um, our lesson today is called Getting There From Here. The background is a larva that is changed to a butterfly. How did the larva become the butterfly? It was a transformation. There was a time of cocoon. To change, we'll have to go through a time of cocoon. We'll have to shut out the rest of the world. We'll have to get alone with God. We'll have to have a, 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 a way to alienate ourselves from all of those things that have, that have dictated where we are so that we can get to where we want to go. In uh, Romans chapter 12, in verse 1, we see that this is biblical. Uh, Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. Now, that word transformed there in the Greek is metamorpho. We get our word metamorphos. Cocoon. We've got to experience this if we're going to change. The word means to change into another form, to transform, to transfigure. Changing values, which change our character, requires, you must have, a time of cocooning, a time set apart to change. It can be a long time, it can be a short time, but there must be a time. 
But what will this do for you? It will change your future. It will literally change your future, your destiny. So back to our question that we begin with, when was the last time you changed something about your value system which changed your character? Lately, recently? <laughs> well, there should have been a transformation. There should have been a changing when you received Jesus. A reason, if not the primary reason, that I came to Jesus Christ was to change. I didn't like me. I, I did not like what I was. I did not like what I had done. I didn't like where I was going. I wanted to change. And one of the main reasons that I came to Jesus, I was only 28 years old. I wasn't worried about going to hell. What I was concerned about was me. I didn't like me. I wanted to change. I had tried everything else. I wanted to see what Jesus could do. And what happens in our lives when we come to Jesus, and I want to give you two quick scriptures that just shows you in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. There is a transformation that takes place, and old things we stop doing, and new things we begin doing. And then in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, but we all, how many of us? If this has happened to us, then this, this, I mean, if you have really been born again, if you really come to Jesus, this will happen to you. But we all, with an open face, as in a glass, the glory of the, see the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You're changed. When you really come, if, if you didn't change when you come to Jesus, you're missing something. Something wasn't right. Something didn't take place that should have taken place. We all are changed. And, there, and initially, when we come into, into the kingdom of God, that initial transformation is basically easy. It's very easy to change. We're so in love with Jesus, and we want to be with Him and around Him, and we just, we just change. And it's very, very simple. But what happens two years sometimes less, down the road when we stop changing. Has the Spirit lost His power to change us? Or have we stopped allowing Him to change us? See, He's still got the power to change us. What's happened is we've just now refused Him to change. His desire is to change you into the image of Jesus Christ. That's what we can become if we just allow His Spirit to keep on transforming us. Uh, in the Bible, uh, was anybody ever changed? I mean, did, I mean, was, I mean a, a total transformation. You see, in, in the scriptures, we see people that experienced such a transformation that they had to change their names. <laughs> I mean, they were so different. Do you know what? Most of you don't call me Delbert. You know what you call me? Pastor. I'm not Delbert to you. I'm Pastor. See, God changed my name. Because he changed my character. Because he changed my values. Abraham wasn't always Abraham. He was Abram. He was a man married to a woman who couldn't have a baby. But he became Abraham, father of nations. He changed. Sarai. The word means dominant. Sarai became Sarah, princess, wife of Abraham. Jacob, scoundrel, trickster, con man, became to Israel. I'll rule with God. Why? Because there went through a time of cocooning. Jacob even wrestled with God. In his time of cocoon, he changed. And you'll change. Simon Barjonas. Remember him? Means little rock. Became Peter, Petrus. The rock you can build on. Paul. Wasn't always Paul. He was Saul of, Saul of Tarsus. Became Paul the Apostle. Why? Because they went through a time of cocooning. They went through a transformation that so, de, so, that so radically changed their futures. Every one of those changed. Now,
now, is God a respecter of persons? No. Does he want to change you and me for the good? Does he want to change our destinies and our futures? Yes, that's what it's all about, folks. When we're born again, we're not just born again so we'll go to heaven when we die. Read the passage in John chapter 3. I can't go there now. I don't have time. But you're born again so you can begin to see the kingdom. And you're born of spirit and water so you can enter the kingdom. What's that all about? It's about getting into a place where your life becomes abundant. I'm going to give you five things. And these aren't magical solutions. See, these people that I just called off, you didn't wake up one day and God just magically tra tra changed them. And it's not going to work that way with you. Now, you can do a couple of things. You can, you can say, say for example, you want to get out of debt. There's two or three things you can do. You can stay like you are, not change squat, and live in debt the rest of your life. You can go down to the convenience store and instead of paying your bills, buy lottery tickets. That might work. Or you can trust God and allow a transformation in your life to so change your destiny that you can become wealthy. Now, let's, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. This is not a magical solution. But it is a progression that we see that happens and will happen in anyone that changes. First of all, the first thing I want us to see is, is this kingdom first. Now, we must make certain that our hearts are right and that we are seeking to change for the correct reason. Now, let me explain to you what I'm trying to say. See, our reasons to change must come from the kingdom. We're not going, we're not, we're, we're born again, we're born of the spirit and water so we can enter the kingdom. We're not, we're not getting there, we're supposed to already be there. What, what we're doing there is we're beginning at the kingdom. We're getting the kingdom thought. What is the kingdom thought? And we're going to use finances. Just We could use anything. We could use weight loss. We could use anything. That change, home and family. We could use the, uh, job situations, whatever. But if, if we beginning hit the kingdom, what does the kingdom say about it? What does Jesus say about this? What does he say that I've got to begin with? What's the idea? What's the thought that he's going to give me to start with? Now let me explain to you what, what I'm trying to say here. Uh, you know, Jesus said this, But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. So, you see, the kingdom is not this mystical, theoretical thing that's going to come one day. It is something that is available for us to enjoy right now. It's, it's his good pleasure to have given us the kingdom. Sell your possessions, he says, and give to the poor. Provide purse for yourself that will not wear out a treasure in heaven that will not exhaust, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, most of us want things. Do, do we not? Would you like to have some more nice things? I, I mean, I, I would. I'm not, this isn't a trick question, and I know you say, oh boy. Uh, I want more things. If you want more things, raise your, you want a nicer car, nicer, you know, nicer stuff. Okay, that's good. That's really good. There's nothing wrong with things. There's nothing wrong with you having things. The problem is when things have you. I don't, there's nothing wrong with me having things. It's when things have me that a problem begins. Right? God wants you to have things. That's what he's talking about here. Here's how you get things if you're in the kingdom. You begin at the kingdom level. What does the kingdom say? <laughs> Seek you first. That's good. <laughs> now, values come out from the kingdom. Now, let me explain. <laughs> there was this scene in the Christmas carol where the, the ghost, the spirit of Christmas present, took Ebenezer to church. That's where he got born again. <laughs> he went to church, and at church he was allowed to see Cratchit and Tiny Tim, who were diligent, faithful believers of Jesus Christ. He was able to see his nephew and his nephew's fiancée. 
not uh, uh, Chris Scrooge's nephews and his fiance. And then Scrooge goes through this transformation. Do you know who received the blessings from Scrooge's transformation? Cratchit got an immediate raise. Tiny Tim got health care. His nephew was made a partner of his business and was able then to provide a, a living so he could marry his fiance. You see, what I'm trying to say here, Scrooge's values changed, so people in the kingdom were blessed. When, when, when your values change, when you're no longer worried about just getting things or getting wealth or getting money, in Scrooge's case, and you start looking at people, then that's kingdom. It doesn't stop you getting things. It just means you get better things. We start at the kingdom level. Does that, how, did that, how did what Scrooge did line up with what Jesus said? What, what did Jesus say? Did Jesus say, here's what I want you to do. Sell your possessions. Give to the poor. For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted. See, Scrooge entered the kingdom. He no longer was consumed with getting his things. He gave, and look what he got back. The sad thing is that we have this twilight na, 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 thing about the kingdom. <laughs> am, am I right? It, it's, it's this fictitious thing that's going to come one day. And what ends up happening is we end up living our whole lives missing the kingdom. <laughs> My point is that to achieve the proper values and highest level of character and the abundant life that Jesus came to give us, we must operate from the kingdom first position. What does the kingdom say? I begin there. I'm not going, I am there. I start there. What does the kingdom say? Now I got something to build upon. Okay. Second thing, you got to have an idea and a plan from God. Did Abraham and Sarah and Jacob and Peter and Paul and all those people that we talked about earlier, did they have an, a plan from God? Did God give Abraham a plan? What did he say? Get thee out of Ur of the Chaldees. You'll never have the future you can have as long as you stay here. Get out of Ur, Abraham. Here's your plan. Follow me and I'll take you to a land. Did he give Sarah a plan? This time next year, you're going to have a baby. That's always fast. Why next year, God? Why not now? <laughs> it was a plan. Jacob. Now, this was fascinating. Did God give Jacob a plan? And Jacob has an interesting life. Jacob's running from Esau, and he goes to Bethel, and he lays his head on a rock, and he sees Jacob's ladder. And this so fascinated him that he says, God, if you'll bless me, I'll give you a tenth of everything I ever make. I'm thinking. <laughs> but Jacob did, and God did. And what happened is that now Laban and Jacob's going through this thing, and Jacob's wanting to get out of there. And he's got two wives and two concubines. And I don't know if that's a blessing or not, you know. But <laughs> he got 12 kids. I mean, God, I mean you know, you this. Not counting a daughter. <laughs> but anyhow, he had the money to take care of all this. God. Right. Right. <laughs> I mean, listen, guys, you got to get with. Thanks, sir. <laughs> there you go. It takes a lot of money. Two wives, two concubines, 13 kids, and servants. 
God gave him a plan. He said, here's what I want you to do, dude. I want you to take some poplar branches and some other kind of branches and take them and strip them down and take the bark off of them and put them in the water trough. And when the animals come and see this, they're going to breed and they're going to have ring straight, speckled and spotted. And this is, these are the things that Laban's going to give you. Now, let me hit this while I'm here. You need your own plan. How many, how many of us are going to run home today and, and, and make sure we got some ring straight, we got some sticks stuck in the water trough so that we'll get rich? See, you've got to have your plan. God's going to give you your plan. I've never known Jacob's plan to work for anyone else. <laughs> Did he give Peter a plan? Follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. You're no longer Peter. You're no longer Simon. You're Peter. And upon you, I can build. What about Paul? He could follow the plan. Saul at that time? No. Get into the city and wait. And I'll tell you what you got to do. Everybody's got their own plan. You got to have a plan, and the plan's got to be from God. Nothing will change as long as it remain, remains an idea. The idea must be changed to a plan. How many of you have ever had an idea to get out of debt? <laughs> Two years, five years, ten years, still in debt. Did you ever make a plan? Did you ever form a budget? Did you ever submit that budget to counseling? Was it, a, was it, a, was it something you could pull off? Was it, was it a plan you could really do? You got to have a plan. The plan has got to be more than an idea. It's got to be intricate. And you got to see what's happened in your past, what's happening in your present, and what's happening in your future if you don't change, but what will happen in your future if you do change. Where do you want to go? How do you want to end? You control it by your values that you change now. By the plan. Now, a lot of people think I only give, uh, you know, us biblical theories and examples, you know. You know, like Jacob putting these sticks in the water troughs. That's going to change us, right? That's practical, right? <laughs> you know, or maybe the opening the Red Sea. You know, that's that we'll all go home and open the Red Sea or move this mountain. You know, what I'm trying to say here is I do that. And I try to make them practical. But today what I really want to do is I want to be as practical with this as I can. And I want to share with you a plan that Judy and I had to get out of debt. Uh, this plan changed my future. And it wasn't just to get out of debt. I wanted to get into ministry. I wanted to do what I'm doing. And I was in financial bondage and I couldn't do it. There was no way I could risk being a preacher. <laughs> and maybe you need to be one before you understand that every week you live by faith. You might not come next week, you know? And you can't be in a financial position where that's going to knock you out. In 1978, Judy and I were saved. We had an experience. In 1983, we wanted out of debt. Good idea, right? Good idea. She was seeking God. I was seeking God. We were seeking his kingdom. We knew what it said about debt. But God gave us a plan. Now, I can say it was God now because it worked. <laughs> you know, I hear a lot of people saying, God told me, you know, and, uh, and, and everything's a mess. And you're thinking, no, no. <laughs> we agreed on the plan, and uh, we wrote it in the book. This was my prayer book. The plan right there. 
Lots of prayers are in here. It's a time when I was writing my prayers. Your prayer is when I, in there when I prayed for your head and got the knot off of it. It's, it's in there. I was reading it. See, she's really a knot head. That I, No, I take that back, Lord, 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 Lord. <laughs> no, I shouldn't have said that. I repent. <laughs> we wrote the plan. We anointed it with oil. We agreed on the plan. We laid hands on it together, and we prayed. And we, had, we asked God to help us. The plan wasn't just to get out of debt. The plan was so I could go in the ministry. I could stick the king. He changed my future. We were heavily in debt. We both worked. We made good money. Credit card, house payment, car payments, utilities, personal loans, boat payments, clothing bills, you name it, we probably owed for it. Just like many of you. Our plan was simple. We had built a house in 1972. It's now 1983. We had 11 years of equity built up in this house. We would sell the house, cocoon, move my whole family in with my parents, live there while we built another house. The plan was to take the equity that we would get from that house that we sold, build a new house, pay off all our bills first, and then what was left, build a new house. Now, there, theoretically, there was not enough money to do that. But we felt like God had given us the plan, and we stepped out. I gave to the church what I should have given. I did what, what my part was because I wanted God involved in my plan. But we didn't stop with an idea. We made a plan. Now, your plan to get out of debt might be totally different. You might not have a house with 13 years, I mean, 11 years of equity. You may have to get another job. You, your plan might be to, to make a budget and cut down. My plan took us six months. Your plan might take you six years. But you've got to change the idea to a plan. And you've got to believe it's from God. And you've got to build it on what the kingdom says. Third thing, discipline. This is the hardest part. Getting a plan is easy. Getting an idea is easy. Writing the plan, praying the plan, getting it from the kingdom is easy. The hard part is the discipline part. Now, what that simply means is I must discipline myself to fulfill the plan. This is the most difficult step, but it's the most important step. A recovering alcoholic must discipline himself. Not, it's a good idea not to get drunk anymore. It's a good idea. And they can have a plan. I'm going to go to AAA every week. But if he does not discipline himself to stay away from that alcohol, he's going to die an alcoholic. You can have a great plan, great budget, but you can die in debt. got to have a plan, but you got to discipline yourself to fulfill the plan. If your plan is, I'm, only, I'm not going to spend $5 a day for lunch, then you can't spend $5 a day for lunch. You've got to take a hot dog from home. So it's simply the discipline. In my plan, at that particular time in my life, I was working in manufacturing on the night shift. I worked from 12 to 8 in the morning, unless I had a meeting which would get me home a little later, but every day I came home and I disciplined myself every day to go to work on it. I worked all night, been up all night, went to work on that house. Every day. I'd work till about noon, I'd go home and crash. Judy would get home about five, the kids were home, supposedly had their homework done, we all got up, a whole family went over to that house. And we worked till nine or 10 o'clock at night. We'd all come back home. They'd get bathed, they'd go to school, to get ready to go to school. I'd crash for an hour, get up and go to work every day, except Sunday. She and I made an agreement to begin with, Delbert, we're not going to work on this house on Sunday. We're going to spend that day with Jesus, we're going to spend that day with the people that we love. And we never did it, not one time did we ever work on it on Sunday. But in six months' time of doing that, I was out of debt. I was living in a totally constructed, brand new, 
larger house, nicer house than I was in. The money did make it. It was enough. And I was out of debt. Why? Because I had a plan from God. I was a kingdom perspective. An idea, a plan. And I disciplined myself to do this every day. Now, whatever your plan is, you've got to be something that's realistic that you can do. And you've got to discipline yourself to do it. You can have a great idea and a foolproof plan, but if we will not discipline ourselves to do the plan, nothing will change. Um, the fourth thing, the habit. The kingdom first. Idea from God, discipline must then become a habit. Why do we discipline to do anything? Why do we discipline our children? Is it just because we got mad at them? Is that the reason that we really discipline our children? Or is it to work into them proper habits? A habit not to do this and to do this. Discipline is to create within us habits. Habits will create values. But you'll never have a value until there's a habit. Becomes a habit. Um, we got the house built. The money didn't make it, but every bit of the money was gone. It took all of the money. Now, if I had not made a habit to control my spending, I would have been right back in debt within the next year. I have helped people numbers of times get their finances straightened out only to see them a year later worse than they were when I got involved. Let's use, let's use weight. That's another one that most of us can relate to. How many of you have ever had a good idea? I want to lose some weight. Come on, come on, wake up now, most of us. Good idea. Had a great plan, a great diet. Man, this diet's going to work. And it did work. And you disciplined yourself. And you lost that weight, didn't you? See, if, if you had the, the idea and the diet and you disciplined yourself and, and you did that, you, did, you lost that weight. But if that, if that controlling didn't become a habit, guess where you were six months later? That weight had found you again. You lost it, but it found you. Why? Because it didn't become a habit. You have to make a habit before it's going to become a value, before it will change your character. Kingdom first. Idea from God. Plan. And then you have to have discipline. The discipline must become a habit. And then finally, the fifth thing, it becomes a value. You're now ready to change your life and change your future. Your life, your future will not change. You can pray it. You can, I can bring you down here and anoint you with 55 gallons of oil. <laughs> I can cast demons out of you until, until you fall on the floor and say, please stop. <laughs> but until this takes place in your life, until you cocoon, six months, six years, until you seek the kingdom, you get with God and allow the Spirit to help you and change you, You'll die the way you are right now. That is, unless you take all your money and buy lottery tickets and happen to win the lottery. That's, it's about like taking sticks and sticking it in water troughs, isn't it? That's, that's <laughs> if it doesn't become a habit, it will never become a value. It will change our character. Value. Financial liberty is now a position in your life. It will be in your life for the rest of your days. You will control your spending. Instead of spending, you'll save. Instead of, instead of interest being your enemy, it will become your ally. You'll start watching the stock market instead of not even knowing what the stock market means. What is, the, what is Dow Jones? What is that anyway? Because you're interested in interest. Everything changes. Your life changes. 
Delbert became pastor because I changed that value in my life. When you introduce me to your friends, this is our pastor. And then you mad at it, his name is. Why? Because I took something that I was not happy with in my life and I made it a value so that I would be happy with it. Now, seen much in our, in our study. You know, it all goes back in the box. We spend our lives hopping around the board, casting, throwing dice, right? Hopping around life, trying to acquire things. You know, hoping to, you know, go directly to go and get that $200, you know. But at the end of the game, I don't care how well you play it, Ebenezer played it well, but it was all going to go back to the box. Monopoly game goes back to the box. Everything you've got that's not of kingdom value goes back to the box. I want you to get out of the box. And it's going to take a cocoon. We saw also values from the kingdom, where we get our, where we get our values from. We get our values from, from, from our, our home family, from our society, and from our peers. I want you to get them from the kingdom. What does Jesus say about it? And start building on that. Well, yeah, what I want to really challenge you with, though, today is how do you get there from here? It requires a cocoon. If you're going to change, you're going to have to seek his kingdom. You're going to have to forget about things. And just do things as the kingdom says. And his, his promise to you and I is, I'll give you things if you'll seek my kingdom. I have more things now than I had then, and they're all paid for. Well, I'm most of them paid for. But I am not the same person because of a cocoon. And I want you to do that. I want you to, what do you need to change in your life? I encourage you today. Get out of the box. Get your values from the kingdom and then go into the cocoon. And let's see how much you can change. Let's pray. Father, we love you. You're a magnificent Lord. And you cared no more, Lord, about Abraham than you care for me. You cared no more about Sarah than you care for me. You cared no more about Jacob than you care for me or Peter or Paul. You didn't care any more about them than you care for me. And Lord, you don't care any more about anyone then you care for all of us. You love us all. We're important to you. And Jesus, your word tells us you come to give us an abundant life. And if we will seek that life, you'll give us things. Father, I pray now for every person that during this time of Lent, during this time where we've separated ourselves to you, that we'll select something and begin to build upon it in your kingdom so that our lives can transform and we can change our destinies and our futures. Help us, Lord. If your head's bowed, your eyes closed. Preacher, yep. You're all in my stuff today. I don't really like you being in my stuff. But I do believe that I need to change. And there are some things that I really want to, and I thank you for the plan that you gave us. I thank you for sharing those things with us. And I intend to real soon develop a plan, a discipline, a habit so I can change the values and change my life because I don't like where I'm going and I want to change. If that's you, just slip your hand up and just encourage me and say, that's me. Good, great, 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 great. Thank you, thank you, thank you.